Hi there, and welcome to this week's class. Um, so this is part of my series called Develop Your Drawings. And, um, and so far in this series, I've covered a few topics. We've been looking at using watercolors. And uh, last week, we did a great exercise of starting to work big. Um, so this week, I thought I'd take the opportunity to talk a little bit more about composition and design in drawings. Um, and what this is about is, so often what we're concerned with in drawing is duplicating what we're seeing in the world around us. Um, so we're learning things like how to draw accurately and uh, how to sort of notice tonal values and modelling of form and all those sorts of concerns. Um, composition is where we start to think about making a picture, OK? And it takes a little bit, it's a slightly different mindset from just um, studying the world and trying to sort of communicate it as accurately as possible. So it requires a different way of thinking. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, today is I'm just going to show you basically what I'm trying to communicate is the thinking process in composition. How do you start to think about composition when you're making your drawings? Um, and hopefully it will give you the tools that if you decide that you you find a subject that you're interested in. So at the end, you should be able to go through a process of planning your drawing so as to get nice composition. Once you've got the composition down, you can then focus your attention on how accurately you draw the subjects. Anyway, so I'm going to uh, go over to Clip Studio Paint and uh, give you some examples. OK, so here I am, Clip Studio Paint, and I'm just going to um, we're going to start off with some basic principles. OK, so we're going to start with the idea of taking on a single subject. So let's decide that you, you want to do a drawing. Uh, you're looking around your house and you're trying to find something to draw. So you're probably going to start by picking out individual objects. That's probably the easiest way to go. So I'm just going to run through a few ideas as if I was drawing Let's take, we'll start with an apple, say. Okay, so I'll do a sort of simplified. Okay, so there is my apple. Now, one of the things we need to start doing when we're thinking about composition, and you'll see, you've seen me talk about this, is we need to start thinking about our frame, okay? So whatever is located within this frame uh, tends to relate to the sides. Um, it affects how we sort of perceive the world. So again, it's a bit like looking through a viewfinder on a camera. Um, this is why I find that using, if you use a page in a sketchbook and you just go up to the edge, it somehow doesn't tend to get you in the, the right mindset of composition and design, okay? So by limiting ourselves with a border here, we can more think, how are our shapes within going to relate to the to the border? OK, so now I'm not saying everyone would do this, but most people who haven't been trained or aren't thinking in terms of composition. Will tend to locate the object in the middle of the page. OK, um, and so this from a compositional point of view isn't a great idea, um, but it's sometimes it's not always obvious why this might be a problem. Um, so if I draw um, some lines here, what you'll notice is, is the spacing um, between the borders is very equal. OK, so if we move that up there, we move that down there. OK, so we end up with these shapes here. One, two, three, four. OK, and because they're so similar, what it does is it creates a very static composition. OK. Um, so one of the principles that we're trying to understand is we're trying to sort of entertain the viewer. OK, and one of the ways we can entertain the viewer is by balancing the ingredients of um, variety and similarity. OK, um, so if we've got variety here. OK, similar. So if variety is all over the place, too much variety, OK, um, can be sort of chaotic. Um, if we go to the other end, then similarity, everything's the same and it's rather boring on the eye. OK, um, so 
<laughs> certainly when I started drawing and I was going through a sketchbook, I would tend to by habit locate the object in the middle. Um, so now we understand a bit about that, we can understand a little bit more about how to solve that problem. OK. So if we have our page. So artists have come up with sort of different sort of schemes and ideas for thinking about composition. Um, one idea um, is just simply this. So let's say if I draw my apple. OK, and then. So what I can do, this is obviously the advantages of working on a computer is I can just this would be in my viewfinder. I can sort of try and look at what would make this. Where would it be interesting? OK. So on the principle of variety, if I put it down there. Um, OK, um, then we've got we've solved some of these problems. OK, so it's more interesting because we have. Um, so we've got this relationship, OK, and that's obviously a bit more dynamic than before. OK, and we have a large shape there. So you can just move around and you can sort of try and find compositions that work well. Um, one thing I would say, though, is. What I have found in my classes is if we move the apple over here, um, this tends not to work quite so well. OK, and if you look at it, um, I think it's because of this principle, which is that um, when we're reading a painting, um, what happens is we tend to our eye tends to come into an image in this direction. So it's a bit like how we read a book. We start here and we try to find out what's interesting here. We come in and we've already reached our interest, our sort of focal point. OK. And that means we have very little, um, very little reason to go and look at the rest of the picture. Um, whereas if I move it here, OK, if I move it to the side. Um, then we've got this, we can take this whole path into our picture, into the picture space um, and we meet our focal point on that side. So as a general rule, um, what I found is you don't, I don't tend to put my in, my most interesting thing uh, on this area of the canvas. I mean, that's just me, but I say you have to sort of, there's obviously ways you can balance it out and create other focal points. OK, but that's just if I was just doing a single object, I would probably avoid that location. OK, um, so another principle that's quite um, useful is the rule of thirds. OK, and that is where you take your picture. And you divide it into thirds like so. And where these points meet, these crosses, um, these are regarded as good compositional areas to locate an object. OK, so if we have a look at that. OK, so there. Let's just. Uh, just make that a bit less distinct. OK, so that might be quite good. OK, um, this plays with we've got a relatively small apple here with a large space around it. OK, up there might work well um, and here. OK, so hopefully you can see that that sort of divides our picture plane into a more dynamic area. So I think if you're going to pick a single object, um, that might be a good way to start. Um, the main thing I would do, though, is just simply avoid sticking an object right in the middle. OK. So let's uh, try something else. Okay. OK, so we decide we're going to do an apple. So another thing that you can think about is this. OK, um, this is something I like to do in my life drawing class, which is you've got three possibilities. OK, um, so one I like to think of as the close up. So that might be something like. OK, 
that say okay so we're really we've gone in close we it's like if you were doing um a portrait of someone um you would be sort of working like this sort of size okay you're cropping the head and you're getting in close to the subject okay um so you can do that with a still life object as well okay so you don't always have to have the object um you know surrounded by all that space you can move in close um if you're working with say a group of objects like a still life um something like that say okay it can be quite good to crop and uh you know not reveal the entire image itself uh, the, the entire object so that's a close-up uh, secondly, um, you can do something like we've already discovered, which is sort of somewhere between close up and a sort of far away shot. So this would be more like your sort of normal sort of study. OK, something like that. OK, so it's taking up a fair amount of space, maybe about 50 50 in relation to the page. Um, so we call that perhaps just like um, a study. OK. Um, and then oh, another one we can do is where we have, let's say we've got uh, a table. Oh, we've got an apple sitting on the table. OK, um, this one we're making a lot more of the space around okay if you can see perhaps we'll put some objects around like so so it's still the focal point still might be the apple um but we are we're basically doing a zoomed out shot okay And that's got a lot more to do with context. That's about trying to sort of set the scene. So this is why in still life, you might see some examples where people include a, like a whole laid table, maybe with the room and other bits of furniture around. Um, that's very different from doing a sort of close up of, say, a single piece of fruit. Um, so those are three options that give you something to work with. OK, so those are some of the things that you could consider with your subject um, itself. Another thing that you should always consider when you're taking on a subject is um, maybe the dimensions of the frame you're working with. So I gave the example of this sort of frame. OK, um, but obviously there are other options available to you. There is, for example, the square. OK, and there is the sort of more portrait. OK, um, so this um, these tend to this sort of landscape. This is what we'd call more of a landscape sort of format. Um, it tends to create the feeling of relaxation. It tends to be a bit more settled. Um, the square, uh, which often um, you'll see sort of still life artists use, um, is probably the least sort of dynamic of the, uh, the two. Um, and the portrait, again, will emphasize the vertical. So if we were doing our apple, um, you know, this could be a table or something like that. And there we've got our apple um, in the square. You could say have your your close up. Something like that. OK, and then the vertical, you could almost have like something. You can see a rather sort of grand, uh, dramatic um, sort of composition. Now, you see these little thumbnails, they're really, once you get going with them, they're quite fun to play with. Um, and again, you can sort of stretch these all a bit further. So you could even go for something. This is more like cinema, cinema screen. OK, and then you think, well, how would I break up that space? OK, so again, you wouldn't want to break up the space bang in the middle. Um, so you're trying to create some sort of, sort of dynamic energy. So again, maybe just like our close up like so. OK, um, 
so yeah you can play around with your composition device i mean some artists in the past have even used circles so you can use circles they're um quite sort of fun to try and sort of design things in um let's just say like so okay so yeah circle design obviously not quite so applicable if you're using um, canvas or something like that, if you're actually going to do a painting, but certainly for our drawing, you could certainly design within a circle would be quite an interesting challenge. Um, so all of these things can be considered. Now you could say, well, what am I trying to achieve? So I've said about how you're trying to stimulate the viewer. You're trying to create interest. Um, but also, you know, you have to think that your, um, your design and your composition should all be in service of an idea okay which is another principle of composition which i i didn't understand initially um so one of the books that i have on composition i'll just show you this is um let's So this is one of the books I would recommend if you're interested in going into the subject in more detail, Composition by Arthur Wesley Dow. OK, and in it, he talks a lot about um, looking at design and pattern and these sorts of things. And um, so I was just reading through it the other day. And what struck me, one of the points he makes at the beginning of the book is he thinks actually you're better off to start from the principle of design um, than from the principle of sort of duplicating the world outside you okay so um, design I say is often in service of a mood or an idea so when you're composing something you have that principle in mind so to give you an idea what this what this might mean um, I heard it once that sort of a, a lot of American illustration might have a subtext of celebration. Celebration. OK, so how do you express a celebration? So regardless of whether I draw an apple or whatever my subject is, if I do these sorts of marks, OK, Can you see how this creates perhaps those lines themselves on an abstract level create the mood of a celebration? OK, so it wouldn't be um, too difficult. You see, we've got lots of diagonals, which are sort of dynamic. We've got spirals, that sort of thing. OK, so if I was to take that out, once we've got our idea, um, then we can sort of design in that sort of style. So, for example, Let's say I'm doing my apple. OK, um, you could have like, say, more plates. You would have like maybe bits of fabric around, maybe some other things in the distance. Anything to sort of create that sort of dynamic energy that's going to help sort of create this mood, this sort of almost explosive mood of celebration. OK. Um, but that's, I say, that it's to do with sort of temperament and what you're trying to explain. If you know um, Mirandi, Mirandi's work, who was a sort of still life artist, they're often talked about as like meditations on objects, okay? And so if you look at Mirandi, often his um, his compositions might be like bottles or things like this okay a lot less use of diagonals i'm just using these lines to create this is like the abstract idea say of a mirandi composition um a lot more static um and therefore quieter calmer obviously the colors and everything else will help um sort of pull into that idea so again if i was doing my apple OK, we might have our apple. OK, perhaps everything would be done. So even just that is going to be a lot quieter. If I introduce other objects. Oh, 
like so. You see, it has that sort of meditative. It's it's basically calm. As soon as you start to introduce like things like fabric and sort of um, diagonals in there, maybe things coming out here, and you know, that's it. Completely changes the energy and the mood. Okay. So having some sort of like um, mood or flavor in mind for your drawing can also be a, a really useful way to start thinking about composition and design. OK, so what I've done so far is really looking at the elements of line and sort of placement. OK, um, in the book I mentioned, he talks about thinking in composition in terms of um, line, tone and color. OK, so we're not going to worry about colour today because we're sort of focusing on drawing. Um, but I'll say a few more things about tone. Okay. So, again, we start very simple and then you can apply it in a more sort of complex way. OK, so here's our still life and we've got our horizon. OK, and then we're going to draw... Our apple there. Now, from a tonal point of view, I'm not talking about tone here, tone as sort of modeling and shading to create three dimensional form. We're trying to think of tone from a design point of view. So often what artists will do is they'll try and take their scene and you can even break it down into black and white. So um, let's have a look at this. Um, So that could actually be the tonal idea, okay? It could be a dark object on a light ground. And actually that's not a bad tonal design. Um, it Obviously it has a lot to do with sort of silhouette. Um, so obviously perhaps, you know, I've done that very quickly, um, but that's not a bad idea. Um, another simple tonal idea, which would be, um, OK. So now we've got, let's put a little bit of shadow on that. OK, I've, so I've now got a a light shape on a dark ground. So in fact, what I might do there is maybe put that there. OK, so this is like designing with black and white. Um, and I would say this is a really good. Uh, this is what he talks about. This book note about no tan. This is like designing just with black and white. And um, yeah, you're going to create very strong sort of designs here. Now, obviously, you're going to sort of moderate them. Um, and you will, you know, as you shade in everything, you'll get a lot more subtlety. But this can give you your big idea. Um, and I think it's really important. Um, say so you're trying to keep things simple. So I'll just give you a few more examples. Let's see. So let's say I'm doing a pair. Something like that. OK, that's like my pair design. Um, and then I can simply, well, let's put our, no, we'll just, we'll do it as a, um, a black and white design. There you see, so even on a sort of black and white level, that works quite well. Um, and I can obviously create a little bit more interest. Maybe let's say I get some white. Go back in with my pen. Maybe a little bit of highlight there. Um, and in the same way, maybe create a little bit of texture there. 
So that's what he's talking about is um, in the book is to try and break your subjects down into black and white. Another thing you can do with this is to go over perhaps some old um, images that you've already created um, and see if you can really sort of simplify them. So these sorts of tonal studies, the simplification will make them read in a much sort of stronger way. Um, so that's two tone, um, black and white. Um, but what most artists do when they're designing things is um, work with three tones. OK, so remember, real life is going to contain, you know, hundreds of tonal values. So we've got a lot less to work with. Um, So three tones. Now, just as a general principle, I came across this idea once, which was um, good painting. Um, I, th I don't know if this was Joshua Reynolds, but someone went over um, and looked at all the sort of like Renaissance art, great art in sort of like Italy and these sorts of places. And they started to try and see whether there were formulas or patterns. And I heard about this once, which was a formula for um, tonal design, which was that um, good paintings are sort of divided this way, they reckon. So dark. mid value and gray uh, light okay so i think the idea was um 50 percent okay 25 percent and 25 percent white okay so that's one way of breaking up compositions um i prefer this idea which is let's just go back here okay um one of the books I had had this principle, which is like the three bears is. Um, let's see, the three bears, big bear, mummy bear. And baby bear. So this is the three bears is big, medium, small. OK, some, a little, a lot. Um, and then in this principle, you could break it down in any way you fancy. OK, so as long as um, you've got those three ingredients, so we could have our dark, a little bit of dark, some mid value, OK, and most of it white. But the idea is that when you when you're designing your composition, you're basically saying it's mainly one thing. It's mainly mid value or it's mainly gray or it's mainly dark. And then you're playing the other values off that. OK, so this is really useful. So how would I apply this to our still life? OK, let's have a little go. So we'll do the uh, OK, we'll do another apple. So the apple is a substitute for any sort of subject you fancy, really. OK, there's our horizon. And a little bit of a shadow. OK, so we're trying to think about this. Um, obviously, how you set it up will determine, you know, that will get you thinking in terms of what your compositional design is. Now, I'm going to take, let's say we're up against a bright window here. OK, then this is usually the way I would sort of probably think. So. Um, So dark object, OK? Dark object against um, this is going to be light. So that's our uh, mostly light. And then that means that our ground is going to be gray. OK, so let's just. So that might be my starting point. Again, you could sort of play around with. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be 100 percent like that. And. You know, you might have other bits going on like so. Um, 
okay but that's your that's your sort of general composition so if you look at the other combinations what else could we come up with this is just using that linear model okay um so again classic still life would be you've got a black background okay a light object Let's put give it a dark shadow. Dark shadow like that, and maybe a mid value on the table there. See? So that again works quite nicely. So um I think this is this is the reason why this is often like the classic is because your object, which is obviously your most interesting thing, tends is lightest, and I say your eye tends to get pulled towards what is light okay so you've got all of these combinations and i say you can add variation on over the top this is only your starting point so this is why some artists when they go out sketching or painting or looking for inspiration they use um markers and so the markers means you can use a black pen um, a gray marker and you can use that to create um uh, little thumbnail sketches okay so I'm hoping to go out over the weekend and try and do some sketching so I'm going to have a go at this but um, I thought maybe we could um, for today's or for this week's exercise what I'd like you to do is firstly I'd like you to have a go with this um, the main thing with the composition is to try out different arrangements so if you find something and you're really happy with it compositionally, then you could make it into a more finished drawing. Um, but for today, I mean, for this week, I'd be mainly interested to see you trying out lots of different variations with a single subject, okay? So I'm gonna have a quick play around now with um, some landscape themes, um, just to show you how I would sort of play with an idea um, with composition, okay? Okay, so I've got a familiar subject here. You'll recognize this is a Martello Tower, um, which are interesting sort of structures dotted around the uh, Suffolk coastline. I think going back to the uh, Napoleonic Wars. Um, this one actually, I think, is famous for having a, if you look closely, it almost looks um, like it's got a smiley face. Um, Having said that, if I was doing a picture of it, I don't think I would try to include the smiley face. As I say, it's just one of those things that um, sometimes nature provides things that don't read quite so well in paintings. So remember, all design and composition is in service of an idea, okay? So obviously, if it was like a children's story or something like that, having a sort of smiley face building might be, you know, something you might want to explore. But if you were creating a sort of painting about, you know, Suffolk landscape it might not be this uh, the main thing you would want to include so how would I apply the, the design process well obviously this is a photograph that I've taken so I've already actually you can see I've already located it in our rule of thirds okay so here's our landscape composition um, so rule of thirds would put it about there okay and as you can see that's about where I have put it. So again, it's a, it's a nice um, design, I think, because it's a very sort of simple idea. So we've got a bit of a background there, okay? So the design process says, well, are there any other sort of solutions or things I could come up with that might be interesting? Well, as I said, one of the things we could do is we could change the format. So we could actually make this more cinematic, okay? Widescreen sort of TV. And then the um, where are we going to put our where are we going to put the horizon? The horizon is like our eye level. So if you know your composition, as I said, division of objects. If it's half and half, that tends to be a bit boring, which is why generally artists try to avoid dividing the space equally between the sky and the land. So um, things that you might consider are, well, is it an interesting sky or is it an interesting piece of land? OK, um, and I would say, well, they're both. It was a particularly overcast day, um, so we could try. We could just try some of them out. So if we put our, we'll put a lower landscape like this. OK. 
So there's, and we'll move our Martello tower here. Okay, so that could be an interesting sort of design. Um, and what else could we do? We could also do, perhaps instead of that zigzag, uh, well, we could also perhaps use the sky to, you know, bring our eye in. This is another idea in composition, which is leading lines. So you lead your viewer into your subject. OK, so I'm sort of just doing that there. Um, perhaps this would be a bit taller. The windows like so. OK, so that's a possibility. Um, that would be uh, one sort of solution to it. Um, how about a uh, portrait? OK. So let's. something like that. Now, it's difficult because a, a landscape tends to predominantly emphasise the um, the horizontal. OK, so this will tend to reinforce and, you know, sort of play with the verticals in a scene. Um, so um, it's still an interesting space to. Um, so maybe I could do this sort of thing. You know, we talked about the close up so we could have. Something like that. OK, so that might be a close up view um, and that might be quite interesting. In fact, I quite, I quite like that. I think that works nicely. Um, so we can see little colour variations. Um, so, you know, maybe um, zigzags sort of in the ground, something like that, again, could just make the composition a bit more dynamic, say. Um, so those are possibilities. So that's the close up. Um, we could also play around with our are really far away shot. OK, so this is where we really emphasize um, distance. So going back to my sort of cinema screen one here. Um, so let's imagine we'll make this more central. OK, so let's make this a low horizon. So low horizon, emphasizing the sky, emphasizing space. Um, and then we could make our Martello Tower. Let's keep it on this side this time. Let's make it. I'll push the idea a little bit. OK, make it really small. And suddenly we have this vast sort of sky. OK, uh, going into the landscape there, sort of concentrating. Like so. OK, and that's going to, you know, that's going to have a certain drama to it, especially maybe if this was a dark sky or something like that. Um, that could work really nicely. So we could actually just have that as a maybe as a silhouette. OK. So all of those present different options. Um, so having thought about that, I would then perhaps try and think about what am I going to do tonally? Um, so. Which one of those did I like the most? Um, well, let's go for. Let's not overcomplicate it for the sake of the exercise. Um, let's just go for. We'll move it off to this side this time. So rule of thirds, we'll go for a higher one. Now I'm just going to that's our tree line there in the distance. OK, something like that. So now tonally. So we don't have to just take the tonal idea there, but if we were Let's just try and break that down. What would I do there? So I would um, I would probably consider that the Martello Tower is going to be my dark. So remember, we're playing with light, medium and dark. OK, 
So we're going to make that a dark shape and we're going to make the tree line a dark shape. OK, so just make sure that's. OK, so they're the dark shapes. And then in this case, I'm going to leave the sky light. And the ground is a mid value. So this is a fairly sort of. Um, let's lighten that just a little bit. So it's still mid value. Something like that. OK, and that's actually often a fairly um, that tends to be what nature produces, the sky being the lightest sort of object um, in the composition. Um, and then sorry. Um, and then it doesn't hit the objects quite so much, so they become dark. Um, so I'm just going to just suggest there might be other things going on there. Like so, OK. Yeah, so that would be quite a good composition, but there are other alternatives. OK, we've got these three ingredients. So how could we play with them? Maybe to create more drama. OK, so let's imagine it's a dark, stormy sky. Um, so in that case, we could go for how about mid value for the sky? That's going to be our grey. Okay. Then the light is going to hit our Martello Tower and we're going to have dark on the ground. And you might think to yourself, well, I don't see that very often. But again, remember, you can modify it, but you do get these effects occasionally if you get... Um, so you get very stormy conditions. The light is coming across and uh, it catches the objects. And I say you modify it slightly. So again, remember, this is only your starting idea, um, but you would bring out sort of texture there. OK. And again, you wouldn't just have pure white on those trees. OK, That's something like that. So. But as a starting place, that's quite an interesting sort of compositional idea. So it's very dramatic um, and Another one, though, it's worth thinking about. There's a great one that you'll often see um, on sort of snowy days. Um, and that is, let's say it's snowing. Um, then what would we we'd go back to this being dark? OK, they're your dark shapes. Um, then you would have your sky would be your mid value. OK, and now your ground has become light. And you would have perhaps like mid value. sort of shapes there. Sort of pulling your eye in, OK, and actually that's quite a popular idea with artists, that one. It puts you'll see it sort of creates interest on the ground, OK? Now, as I say, um, how would this look? Well, often this would also perhaps include gradients if you're actually um, drawing it. Let's see. So you might see that sort of thing. So gradients are quite good. They pull your eye in. But I say for what we're talking about at the moment, we're just trying to come up with these sort of simplified sort of tonal ideas. OK. So obviously I've had to erase them as I go, but you can see now that that would have built up in my sketchbook, like maybe four or five very quick studies, thumbnail studies. Um, and that would then give me ideas about how to create a more finished piece. OK, so that's what I would like you to do. Um, I say you can either work with a still life as your subject or with a landscape theme like I picked here. Um, and I want you to I want you to show me your workings show me that you're playing around with different compositional ideas, both in terms of placement of the object and the size of your canvas and also some of these tonal compositions. OK, and if you come up with one that you really like and you've got time, uh, turn it into perhaps a more finished considered drawing and see how you get on. OK, so that's this week. I hope you find some of that useful and uh, I'll look forward to seeing how you get on. So thanks a lot. See you soon. Bye.